I've been deathly afraid of tsunami since I was maybe second grade. The biggest worry for us here, at now that I, I have my own family, is that the tsunamis come at nighttime. You know, you're happy just to walk away with your life. And the climate crisis is primarily a water crisis. Water-related disasters have more than doubled over the last decade. Let's take action for humanity's lifeblood. For people like me who grew up here in the United States, it's very hard to relate to. I spent my life only a few steps away from a clean drink of water, whether it was my kitchen sink or my bathroom sink. The heat wave is sending more people to ERs in the valley. Does anybody need water? Here, of course, in, in our desert city, we've never had the luxury of taking water for granted. And I think in the future, other cities will, will lose that luxury. So we, we house a lot of the canoes in here. Some people keep theirs in their yards. They keep them inside of their own little personal garages. But uh, what we have here is we have two of the uh, two of the elders here. They're both woodworkers. You don't have them cut yet? Oh my goodness. Where do you get good help at? <laughs> I didn't bring it, I forgot it. This is this is made out of one tree that was uh, over a thousand years old. If, if there was a gold 13,000 years ago when we were here, this is a, a Native American gold. We had a couple of uh, elders on that, that first street there that uh, were, were actually trapped in their home and we had to send a boat in, you know, to get them out, you know, you know get them warm. Uh, feed them, so on and so forth, and house them for, for a week. When the floodwaters came in here last year, they, they were just about a half of a block away from me. So we, we were, I was really close to the point of having to, having to move too, but I didn't, um, I don't know, it's a, it's a tough call to want to move away from this. So we're, we're all people of the water here. This water, this water has been feeding our people and keeping us alive for I don't know, the last 13,000 years. We've always been here. I've been through four tsunami evacuations here inside of the village since I was a, a young boy. We have these tsunami sirens that we're really fortunate to have, but they, they say that they're good for about 10 to 15 minutes of evacuation time. But that means no belongings. No pictures, you, you kind of just walk away and you know you're happy just to walk away with your life. Relocation came about because of the threat of the rising tide. When your front street here starts to flood, it causes you to to realize, you know, our people are not safe. And when, when our, our sea walls start to breach, which is what's been happening, and FEMA and other organizations, you, you have to be in crisis mode for them to come out and fix something. Well, you don't want to get to that mode. Traditionally, uh, our people have, have always made our villages uh, along the river here uh, or along the ocean. And, and that's because all of our food stuff is from right there. So it's so much easier to roll out of the bed and go out the house to jump in your canoe and shoo, you're already at the fishing ground. You should not shy away from looking at ancient wisdom and knowledge to integrate that into technical knowledge that we have to locate and relocate people and infrastructure because very often you can find from ancient ways of how people settled, how they lived, where they lived, good hints on where it makes sense to live. We know this land best because of our ties here. And we've lived this way for thousands of years. Getting folks to think outside of that you know, it's been a process. We've had to, to really educate on why this is important. We're not trying to take anything away from our traditional way of life. You know, we, we, we still want you to fish. We, we still want you to do those things. You just might have to drive down the hill to do it. I always tell people that, that the Quinault's been fishing since we could walk, since the beginning of time. That first time it flooded, this area of my street started filling and then it just started spreading. 
like just really slowly out and over the field and over to the government buildings over there and back connecting to the mouth of the river. But the second time it flooded, it looked like this. Like it was a beautiful blue sky, or blue sky, clear day, the sun was out and we just had the king tides coupled with that wind and it was enough to give it the power to come over. Every time I post it, they're always super jealous of all my posts until that one week comes in winter when everything floods again. <laughs> dollars that we've received so far we're very thankful but it's like a quarter of what it's going to cost to move the villages of Queets and Tohola up on the hill so there's still a lot more resources needed there's a lot more work yet to be done we've always governed ourselves to govern ourselves is critical you know for for Indian people our world is changing and we see that and we know that so you know, we're, we're trying to adapt our management style. We have to do that, not just for us, but for, for our grandkids and their grandkids and seven generations down the road. If we don't do that, then there won't be no fish here. There won't be no trees here. As we uh, go farther down the road here, we, we finally just opened up phase one of our relocation stages. About 20 years ago, the relocation of our medical facility was the first to move out of the tsunami zone. A project like this is a little bit overwhelming. We were fortunate enough to be able to get our, our own 10 million into this infrastructure and we, we recently received 25 million from the Biden administration. Our housing department will be moving through here next and the finished product will be 59 residential lots. The climate crisis is primarily a water crisis. I think uh, best reflected or expressed in two things. The, if you look at the sea level rise, it's sweet water melting from the glaciers, from the Antarctic ice shield, Greenland, and it's also a thermal expansion of water. And also the other um, good example is the different distribution of rainfall that we will have in the future. We are starting to see that we have longer dry spells. We related to that, we have more fires. So all our environment changes if the rainfall changes because the rainfall is that moisture in our ecosystems, in the soils that A, lets our plants grow, but B, also protects us from extreme heat and dryness and those factors. No rain here in the valley, just dealing with the heat, but we've got excessive heat warnings through next Tuesday. And even in the high country, it's going to be uh, well above average. We've got a heat advisory Friday through Sunday. And, and this, is, this is where it gets kind of crazy here. 118 degrees with lows in the 90s. It's going to get hot. There's definitely a higher sense of urgency. We are unfortunately seeing the number of heat-related deaths go the wrong direction every summer. For me, if I could just get that number to stop, that would be a win. And then obviously, if we can start decreasing it, then that's that's really what we want to see. But it's it's more than what I'm doing. It's it's more than the planting trees and all of that. We, we need to find housing. We need to find shelter. We need to meet people where they're at and provide resources to them so that they are not at the high risk of uh, heat-related incident. What we're telling people as we're out here is if you start getting dizzy, if you start feeling faint, it's actually if your heart rate starts to go down and you're just really starting to lose like ability to make decisions, um, you need to get inside. It's about knowing those couple of triggers, letting them know that the libraries and churches act as cooling centers and respite centers for them to get inside um, and to drink some water because it gets dangerous really fast. Dr. Jan, does anybody need water? Absolutely shocking is a good word for it.
we are headed into Arizona heat season, so we know what's coming. And these people are exposed and out in the heat all day long, and it's going to hit 120. There's unfortunately been a, a governance gap for heat. Residents know who to go to pick up their trash. They know who to call if there's a fire in their neighborhood. They know who to go if they're having problems with the, the public infrastructure, the public works. But what if you feel like your neighborhood is too hot? What if you're concerned about the number of people who are getting sick or dying from heat? Who's the problem owner? We're really proud here in the city of Phoenix to have the first publicly funded local government office focused on extreme heat. There's no one here in Phoenix for whom heat isn't some sort of inconvenience. Maybe the seatbelt buckle is too hot. Maybe we pay a little bit more than we'd like uh, on our air conditioning bills. But for some people, heat's an inconvenience. I would absolutely characterize the situation for a portion of the population as an emergency. People are going to the hospital. People are dying. People are calling 911 because of their experience with heat. Unfortunately, we've seen rising public health impacts from heat here in our region. Last summer, we just set another record of heat-associated deaths. 425 people died prematurely because of heat in our county. People experiencing homelessness have approximately a 300 to 400 times higher rate of heat-associated death than the rest of the population. So the best investments we can make to move the needle there are in affordable housing, in shelter. We think that the, the heat risks in the community are held by a, a relatively small segment of the population, which is good news and that it means we can be very focused. I think what we can do is provide guidance, direction, uh, energy, and evaluation uh, to ensure that we remain focused on this really important challenge. I think the water situation, whether it's a function of having too much water in some places or too little water in other places, is absolutely the result of climate change. After World War II, when the advent of air conditioning came into play, we really became a destination for people to relocate and move their businesses and move their lifestyles and come to the desert. The problem then we encountered post-World War II was we still had very healthy agriculture going on locally, and then we had a growing, burgeoning population that really started to move in. And, and people gradually, gradually, change their behavior in terms of how they think about water and how they use water. And so we've seen that as a tangible result in that we've seen demand for water in the Phoenix metro area go down about 30% in the last 30 years, and that trend continues to go downward. Phoenix was actually very carefully chosen by uh, ancient Native Americans who, who first came here and established a, a really impressive and extensive agricultural civilization. Um, and in fact, what they figured out is that they could divert the flows of the Salt and Verde Rivers into an intricate system of canals that, that we still use to this day. Ancient people understood this. They understood that you live where the water flows to, not necessarily where the water comes from. Our water originates as snowpack high up in the mountains. Living downstream actually affords you more drought resiliency because you have the benefit of a larger watershed. The state of Arizona has been experiencing a very extreme drought over the last approximately 20 years or so. And in fact, we can tell from a tree ring analysis that it's likely the worst 20 year drought in about 1200 years. Scarcity is a challenge, but I think it's a little bit of an easier challenge to overcome than sea level rise, for example. It is much easier to move a relatively small amount of water from where it is now to where it needs to be in the future to meet demands than it is to move entire oceans out of cities. About 60% of the water that's delivered in the city of Phoenix actually comes from the Salt and Verde River system, delivered through canal systems like this one. Um, a little less than 40% of the water delivered in Phoenix comes from the Colorado River. And then a very small amount is groundwater. So Phoenix actually invested about uh, on the order of $500 million so that it could move uh, water supplies from the Salt and Verde River system into parts of Phoenix that today are dependent on the Colorado River. We like our sprawl, right? We are, we are not a particularly dense city. Um, here there's a lot of land and homes and businesses are very spread out. And what that means is that we have a very large water distribution system. And it's an expensive one. 
So that is a challenge for us, especially when we look at scarcity and the potential for Deadpool or less Colorado River water availability in the future. We have a lot of options to react to droughts or to preempt impacts of droughts, but those can only normally be leveraged if we work together across different sectors and across different disciplines, science disciplines, and also across borders. Yes, if a drought is only occurring in one country, it's a country level problem. But in the end, the droughts that we face are not respecting any borders and it makes more sense to address these issues in a regional or even a global effort. My hope is that we're able to move our villages up on the hill, ensure that future generations are safe, also ensure that, that our, our way of life is maintained. You know, because without that, that way of life, then, then what are we? And, and are we any more Quinault? I know that it's best for my family if I go ahead and move up there. I know it'll make my kids feel better because now it's just a part of their schooling because their school is in a flood zone too. They have to practice and understand and know about tsunami drills, earthquake drills, all of those things. And that's scary to a little kid. I'm still torn, like it's still a little bit heartbreaking to think about moving out of the lower village because on these days, like when you forget what winter is like, like you can open your window and I can hear the eagles in the trees, like I can hear them coming from over there, flying out to the ocean. I'm gonna miss those things.